Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about hair loss. Hair loss is one of the most common complaints that I see in my dermatology practice and it can affect all genders, all ethnicities, and all ages. We're going to focus on one particular kind of hair loss called androgenetic alopecia associated with telogen effluvia. Now these are big fancy words that I will explain in this video. So welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Dr. Swati Cannon and I am a board certified dermatologist out here in San Diego, California. The dermatologic term for hair loss is called alopecia, and there are many different kinds of alopecias, but the one that we'll focus on today, like I said, is androgenetic alopecia. This is commonly referred to as male pattern or female pattern baldness, and it is one of the most common causes of alopecia in everyone. Androgenetic alopecia can sometimes be associated with telogen effluvium, or rather telogen effluvium can unmask or reveal prior androgenetic alopecia that wasn't noticed before. Telogen effluvium means excessive hair shedding. So as always, I feel like these topics are so broad and in order to talk about everything that I want to talk about, it would probably take like 30, 40 minutes. So instead, we're going to split this topic of hair loss into two videos. So this is part one, and this is going to talk about androgenetic alopecia, the mechanisms behind it, and the at-home treatments that you can try. Part two will focus on what I do in my dermatology practice. So that includes prescriptions and procedures. Now, of course, there's always going to be an overlap between the two videos, but don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can stay tuned for part two. First, let's talk about what's normal. We tend to have 100,000 to 150,000 hair follicles on our scalp. We lose about 50 to 150 hairs a day. So that's actually quite a lot. As we get older, it's normal to see a decrease in hair density. This doesn't mean that you have, you know, androgenetic alopecia, though you might have mild components of it, but age-related hair loss is pretty normal and happens to all of us. And for anyone to notice hair loss, even for patients to notice their own hair loss, it usually requires 50% of the hair to be lost, which is pretty significant. Your hair undergoes four different phases, anagen, catagen, telogen, and exogen. Anagen is the growth phase, so about 90% of your follicles are going to be in the anagen phase, and this phase lasts about two to six years. Catagen is the transition phase that lasts for a few weeks and is the transition phase between anagen and telogen. Telogen is then the resting phase and about 10 to 15% of your hairs at any given time are within the telogen phase. And this phase prepares the hair shaft to shed out of the hair follicle. And the hair shedding phase is then called exogen phase. Once the hair sheds, it then prepares the follicle to make a new hair shaft within the anagen phase. So basically these cycles, you can imagine they're like a clockwise cycle. You know, you go from anagen to catagen to telogen to anagen, but you can't really reverse back. So you can't go back in the cycle. And this will help explain some of the mechanisms of why medications do what they do. Now, what is telogen effluvium? Due to stressors like COVID, surgeries, giving birth, losing a job, these stressors can cause the hair phase to shift from anagen to telogen, causing excessive hair shedding. This is often characterized by the patient losing more than 300 to 700 hairs a day. So this is about double to quadruple what you normally lose. I don't recommend that you count your hairs. I think that that is kind of a waste of time. All of these numbers are averages and your number is gonna be very unique to you and it's not really important to count how many hairs you're shedding, but how you know that you're losing hair is that you'll just see decreased hair density on the, on the scalp. It's important to know that telogen effluvium is different than something called anagen effluvium. So telogen efflu effluvium, like we said, is hair shedding, but anagen effluvium happens when the hair actually doesn't grow for whatever reason. And this can be due to medications like chemotherapy or hairstyles that pull too much on the hair follicle causing inflammation and eventual scarring. So that's why it's important to see a board certified dermatologist to discern the cause between what kind of hair loss this is because the treatments do differ and certain treatments are more effective for telogen effluvium than it might be for anagen effluvium. Now in most people, telogen effluvium normalizes once that stressor is gone. But in some people who tend to have chronic stress or chronic issues, 
this can turn into a chronic form of telogen effluvium, which means that your hair just continues to shed and shed, causing a much greater loss of hair. In some patients with a genetic predisposition towards androgenetic alopecia, this chronic hair shedding can then unmask androgenetic alopecia, meaning it will reveal this pattern of androgenetic alopecia a lot earlier than if the patient didn't have telogen effluvium. Androgenetic alopecia in men, commonly referred to as male pattern baldness, usually presents as receding hairline kind of along the temples or the sides of the hairline here, or as loss of hair density starting at the vertex of the scalp. Over time, this is, you know, this causes a gradual loss of hair and eventually the patient will have absolutely no hair from the hairline all the way to the vertex of the scalp. Now about 95% of men get this and they have some form of androgenetic alopecia that can start at an early age in some patients. So while this is common, it can definitely pose a lot of mental stress and that's why we have this video and all the treatment options because hair loss can be pretty distressing. In women, androgenetic alopecia is called female pattern baldness and it usually presents as widening of the hair part eventually this widening just kind of well it becomes wider causing a loss of hair along the front part of the scalp while still preserving the hairline in most women now why do we get androgenetic alopecia this happens when the antigen phase or the hair growth phase becomes shorter and shorter and this is because there is a sensitivity of the hair follicle towards a hormone called dht or dihydrotestosterone dht is an androgen thus the name androgenetic alopecia so testosterone which is the main male hormone gets converted to DHT in the hair follicle by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. DHT then starts to shrink the hair follicle over time, which then shortens the antigen cycle. This results in thinner and thinner hair and eventual loss of hair over time. It also results in more brittle hair, causing the hair shaft to fall out of the hair follicle more easily. Now the occipital scalp, which is the back of the scalp right here, that doesn't have as many enzymes to convert the testosterone to DHT. So it's more resistant to androgenetic alopecia, which is a good thing because that's where our hair transplants come from. And we're going to talk about hair transplants in part two of this video, so stay tuned. Now in women, estrogen tends to be protective against the effects of androgens on the hair follicle. But once we enter menopause, the estrogen obviously wanes and the androgen effects are much more pronounced thus having a more uh, noticeable effect on hair loss. Now, I have seen women with PCOS or insulin sensitivities that do get to female pattern baldness at a much earlier age, so it's not uncommon to see that, but often it happens as we get older. Now, that is a lot of pathogenesis, and you're probably wondering why you have to know all of this. While we can't control our genetics, we can definitely control the hormonal environment and the milieu within the hair follicle, thus halting the process. Now, notice that I said halting. I didn't say reverse. And that is because reversal of androgenetic alopecia is very tough. That's why it's so important to see a board certified dermatologist when you first see initial signs of hair loss because it's much easier to halt and slightly reverse the process at that time versus when you have much significant hair loss. Now when you first see a dermatologist, you know, we're going to obviously take your history, we're going to do a physical exam, but sometimes we may even order labs if we see any other concerning signs just to rule out any underlying causes of hair loss like thyroid issues or PCOS. But I don't draw labs in every single person. It's not always necessary. Now let's talk about treatments. The number one treatment that I recommend for hair loss, and you probably guessed this, is Rogaine. Rogaine is a trademark name. The generic name is minoxidil. And minoxidil was actually an oral blood pressure medicine that we, when we gave it to patients, we noticed they kind of grew hair everywhere. And so that's why it got converted to a topical formulation for hair growth. And we don't really use it for blood pressure anymore. Minoxidil works by causing vasodilation of the blood vessels in the scalp skin. And animal studies show that it also helps to convert the hair from the telogen phase to the antigen phase. And it also increases the hair follicle size, thus resulting in thicker hair. Remember when I was talking about the hair phases and that it just kind of goes in one direction? Well, when you first start using Rogaine, it wants to convert the telogen hairs to antigen hairs. And when you do that, you still have to shed all of those telogen hairs. So some patients notice an increased level of hair shedding right after they start Rogaine, which I think can be really scary. And so I, really encourage my patients, you know, stick through it. I know it's scary, but stick through it because we have to allow the telogen hairs to go into the antigen phase to allow for hair growth. So minoxidil is over the counter and it comes as 2% or 5%. I 
always recommend men's version of minoxidil or Rogaine 5% to both men and women. And that's because the female version of Rogaine 5%, which is equivalent to the male version of Rogaine 5%, is like literally a pink tax on the female version, making it much more expensive. And I hate it, stupid. So I just recommend that you buy the men's version for everybody. You should apply it once or twice a day and you just kind of apply it and massage it into your scalp and don't wash your hair immediately. You want to leave it on for some period of time. Now, the issue with Rogaine is that it takes a long time to see results. So usually for patients, it takes eight weeks to six months, which I know is like a really broad range, but it takes so many months to see a difference. And that's because hair grows slowly. And so you have to be patient. Also, not everybody responds to Rogaine. So some research studies show that about 40 to 80% of users, again, a broad range. So only a 40 to 80% of users really respond to Rogaine. And you don't really know if you are a responder unless you try it for six months or more. The other downside of Rogaine is that once you use it and you see a difference, you really have to use it forever. It's kind of like applying sunscreen or a skincare product. Rogaine has to be integrated into your regimen. And that's because if you stop Rogaine, then all those nice antigen hairs will want to go back to the telogen hairs and you're going to go back to your baseline. It's not that your hair loss is going to worsen if you stop using Rogaine, but you will just go back to what you would have been if you had never used Rogaine at all. Now, I don't really recommend and Rogaine in pregnancy, just because we don't have any data regarding Rogaine during pregnancy. I did notice hair loss for myself as well. I have female patterned alopecia that's in the beginning stages with the widening of hair part. I noticed this in 2020 when COVID came and really terrorized all of us. And so I have been using Rogaine now for yeah, like a year and a half. And I do notice a difference. And you can see this before and after photo. I mean, it's not the best photo. And this picture of the after is like literally from earlier today. So it's not the best photo, but there is an increase in hair density. I haven't done anything else. Well, I did try Nutrafol, which I will talk about, but I wasn't very consistent with it. So Rogan has really been the only thing that I've tried so far. So that leads us on to the natural treatments. When it comes to multivitamins, biotin doesn't really help for hair loss. And biotin got a lot of hype like many years ago for hair loss, but randomized control studies showed no evidence that biotin actually helps with hair growth. Now it does help with nails and that's really nice, but if you take too much biotin, it can cause acne and other issues so you really want to be careful with all of these vitamins. The vitamins that do help are vitamin D, vitamin B complex, and iron supplements in patients who are iron deficient. Again, you don't want to excessively take all of these vitamins and minerals because there could be issues like something called glossitis, which is like tongue inflammation, other skin rashes that can happen from excessive vitamin intake, but you can take a multivitamin every day and make sure that your vitamin levels are within normal range. Supplements like Nutrafol, which is $88 a month, or Viviscal, they can be helpful. You usually have to take these supplements for a long period of time before you see any sort of efficacy. For Nutrafol, for example, you have to take like four pills a day, and I just got really annoyed and I'm not very consistent with taking pills. I'm like a baby. I, I even take a gummy for a vitamin and I don't even take a pill for vitamin. So I just stopped using Nutrafol. But some of my patients who do take Nutrafol consistently, they do notice a difference and some patients don't. It is an expensive treatment, so I recommend almost putting that money towards other treatments. Nutrafol and Vegamore, something like that. They also make topical formulations that are natural and used for hair growth. I personally haven't tried them, but if you have and you have liked it, please let me know by commenting below. Now, when you Google natural treatments for hair loss, it's like every single ingredient comes up that has been tried and and claimed to be effective. And these ingredients include like onion juice, garlic, capsaicin, aloe vera, caffeine, rosemary oil, castor oil, coconut oil, just everything underneath the sun. So I'm not actually gonna dwell into all of those different treatments, but I will talk about a few that have some studies backing up its use. So rosemary oil is one that was recently studied and it was compared in a head-to-head -head study with minoxidil 2%. And the investigators found that rosemary oil is non-inferior, meaning it has comparable efficacy to minoxidil 2% in terms of hair growth. Now, I never recommend minoxidil 2%. I recommend minoxidil 5%, and there haven't been any head-to-head -head studies with a higher concentration. But you can still try rosemary oil. In the study, they the participants used it every single day, which I think can be pretty tough because it makes your hair greasy. So I recommend using it the night before you wash your hair, and you just kind of massage it into your scalp and then rinse it off. Another natural 
and I put natural in quotes, but another natural supplement is called saw palmetto. And this uh, inhibits the 5-alpha reductase that converts testosterone to DHT. So taking this pill can definitely help with hair loss, but just because it's natural doesn't mean it's harmless. There have been side effects associated with this medication or with the supplement, like GI issues, as well as it interferes with other medications. So before you start any oral supplementation, talk to your primary doctor, talk to your dermatologist, and make sure that there's no issues that you need to be aware of. And, you know, people assume that just because something is natural, it's harmless. And I remind people, poison ivy is natural, but you're not going to want to rub that all over your skin. Natural does not mean harmless. Now, what about castor oil or coconut oil? So castor oil is rich in protein and these fatty acids, so it can definitely help to moisturize the scalp skin. It is also anti-inflammatory, but unfortunately, there's just a lack of scientific evidence regarding its efficacy for hair growth. And it's the same for coconut oil. There have been a few studies, though, that suggest that using coconut oil can help to moisturize the hair and decrease the brittleness of hair. So it's something worth trying. Now, a few months ago on TikTok, I started seeing these rice water reels everywhere where people were using rice water to help with hair growth. So naturally, I definitely had to look that up. Rice water is actually pretty nutritious. It contains vitamin C, vitamin E, certain proteins, and a carbohydrate called inositol, inositol, I-N-O-S-I-T-O-L, inositol. This particular carbohydrate coats the hair, which decreases the friction and causes less frizziness. So it's good for people who have curly, curlier, frizzier hair. But there hasn't been any scientific evidence that suggests that vice water actually helps with hair growth. But what it does is that because it coats the hair, it makes the hair look fuller and more hydrated. If you have thin, fine hair like me though, and you use rice water, it's actually gonna weigh down your hair and make it look more flat. So I don't really recommend it in patients who have fine hair. But I don't think it's harmful, so if you want to try it, go ahead. Now moving on to treatments that you can try at home as well as what I can do in my office. And so this is where that overlap happens. There's a form of therapy called low level laser therapy, LLLT. And this is usually characterized with these red LED lights within a helmet that you can place over your scalp. Usually you have to do these treatments for 30 minutes at a time, three times a week. Studies do show that it helps to increase hair growth. You can definitely buy the LLLT, LLLT helmets at home but they are pretty expensive. We also use it in our office to help with hair growth. But I always combine this treatment with other things like PRP or Rogaine because by itself, I'm not really sure if it's that effective. Well, thank you so much for watching part one of my hair loss video. If you guys have any questions or comments, please let me know below and I will respond. Subscribe and stay tuned for part two, which is going to talk about procedures and prescriptions that we do in a dermatology practice for hair loss. So thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.